Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are discussing train wrecks and the idea of nationalizing freight trains. Our guest, Carrie Leiterson, is a Chicago-based journalist, author, and assistant professor at Northwestern University, where she leads the investigative specialization at the Medill School of Journalism, Media, Integrated Marketing Communications. Her books include Mayor 1%, Rahm Emanuel, and The Rise of Chicago's 99%. And she has just published an article at In These Times called The Case for Nationalizing the Railroads. Carrie Leiterson, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you. I'm going to be here. Uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks for writing this excellent article. People can find it in these times. Nationalization could mean more than one thing, apparently, and happen in more than one way. Uh, can you explain? Sure. Uh, yeah. And especially with uh, railroads, it could happen in um, several different ways on the most basic level. Uh, nationalize nationalization is public ownership um, of a, an industry or a, a, you know, a factory or a steel mill, um, a lot of things, actually many more things than people would I'm sure realize have been nationalized at some point in US history. And we currently have uh, plenty of things run by the government, which are, you know, essentially nationalized. But um, in terms of railroads, and we're, we're talking about freight railroads mostly right now, um, they are all, all privately owned and run, which uh, and highly profitable. Um, and I'm sure we'll get into some of the problems with them that uh, maybe could be alleviated through nationalization. So what nationalization could mean uh, on the most drastic level is the public owning, you know, essentially the whole freight railroad system, including the trains and the tracks and um, the, you know, running the business of shipping freight uh, with these trains on these tracks. Um, another model that happens in a lot of countries that might be a little bit more realistic in the, the shorter term um, would be the, the public owning the infrastructure, like the tracks and the railroads and the other signals and infrastructure that, you know, are necessary for the trains to actually run on and then private companies could still own and operate the trains but having the public own the infrastructure um, could be a way to make a lot of improvements and uh, there are a few different ways you could get from here to there right uh, probably more than a, a few, or some people might say no ways. Um, uh, you know, it's a, I guess a, a couple things I could mention. Um, you know, opponents of nationalization are probably visualizing the government coming in and seizing these companies, and you know, like uh, uh, what they might see is has, having happened in Cuba or Venezuela or something. Um, you know, if it got close to actual nationalization, I'm sure you'd hear a lot of hysteria about that. But, um, you know, on a more realistic um, and less controversial level, um, the government could and, you know, has done in different cases um, kind of buy up or buy out um, parts of the industry um, for land. It, you know, you can use eminent domain where um, stakeholders are compensated if their property is in some way taken. That happens all the time. Um, uh, you know, you could have uh, the government, the public just uh, buying up stock in publicly traded companies. That's a way that actually um, there's been calls to nationalize the fossil fuel industry and other industries in that way. Um, so there are uh, and there's uh, the government has, you know, different emergency powers that have been invoked, especially during wartime. And, you know, we heard about the Defense Production Act, um, the concept of invoking that during the pandemic. So, you know, there's ways in an emergency that the government can take at least temporary control of an industry and, you know, for the public good. And this uh, is arguably an essential public service, right? In the way that the government owns the highways and the waterways. I mean, when the workers on the railroads strike, President Biden steps in to prevent them uh, negotiating on their own because it's a critical national uh, utility, right? So this wouldn't be some random industry uh, that the government simply wanted. This, there's an argument for this, right? Right, exactly. I mean, it just actually makes a lot of sense. It's not something that's just a luxury. It's absolutely crucial to the functioning of our 
society, you know, which is the reason that the administration stepped in to prevent a strike. Um, so by that same logic, uh, you know, it is something that the public um, is dependent on and should have the, um, you know, you could argue should have the power to, um, to run in the best way possible. And we're, you know, usually the good capitalist argument against public ownership of anything is all the benefits of competition and all the hundreds of railroad companies that are competing and improving their services through competition. Uh, but it's more of a cartel of four companies with a monopoly on the railroads corrupting the government that's deeply involved with them already, isn't it? Are, are we dealing with a, a choice of a, of a free market here? Yeah, I mean, that's the really interesting um, uh, point is that it's sort of a lose-lose situation as far as the, the public and the workers are concerned because you don't have the benefits of public ownership, but you also don't have the benefits of competition because it has developed into this quasi near monopoly where four major companies own the tracks and and run the the vast majority of the freight and it's really two on the west half of the country and two on the east half of the country and then there's um two canadian railroads that also have a, a decent share um but basically you know if you're shipping you only have a, a choice of um probably one of two or three railroads uh so so there's really not those benefits of competition that um, you would have in other sectors. And and so who wants nationalization? Who who is it that's proposing this or or is in favor of it? Well, I mean, a really interesting thing about this whole story, a pretty exciting thing, is um, the the discussion is really being pushed in a lot of ways by this organization called Railroad Workers United. That's a an independent labor organization um, that formed about I think fifteen or so years ago um, with members of the twelve different rail unions. That's one of the problems with this sector is that there's twelve different labor unions formally representing workers, which makes it hard to have a unified front. Um, so anyway, this group, Railroad Workers United, has really been passed a resolution in favor of nationalization and has really been pushing the issue. And um, other pundits and um, experts have been weighing in, um, both actually calling for nationalization and um, definitely calling, you know, there's just widespread acknowledgement that the railroad freight railroad system is really broken. Um, the shippers that rely on it to ship goods have been making that case for a while, including at these big hearings back in April, even before the um, the possible strike and the recent derailment. Um, so, you know, there's there's widespread acknowledgement that something really needs to change. And then nationalization, you know, in our society is a pretty radical thing to bring up, but um, probably driven by the workers and, you know, getting more traction. Um, they're actually, it actually is a concept that's being floated and explored. It, it, let me play devil's advocate for a minute. It seems a little odd that workers who had not been done very well by, by this government would want to give this government more power. There are people, um, uh, Stephen Donziger wrote a, an article in The Guardian advocating that Biden declare emergent, an emergency in Ohio right now, specifically in order to empower some committee of non-government officials that wouldn't be as corrupt as the EPA or any elected corrupt Congress members to, to deal with the situation in Ohio what would make the government become less corrupt uh, if if you gave it the railroads? Yeah, no, that's such a great question and point and, you know, irony um, in this idea that right after the strike or as the strike's being crushed by the government, you would call for government ownership. Um, so, yeah, I think it all comes down to, you know, what does the government mean? I mean, that's where it's, you know, maybe makes sense to use the word public instead of government, um, because you can have terrible, uh, I write about energy and, you know, the, there's a lot of, or at least a number of examples of, um, government owned, um, both local and federal, uh, energy, um, entities that, you know, have terrible records. Um, so it doesn't inherently, and, you know, workers are treated badly by government employees all the time. Um, so it's not inherently a solution. So like what, 
uh, proponents of nationalization are pushing is not only public ownership, but actually an ownership structure that has a uh, that's democratic, you know, as, as sort of a representative democracy structure and has a prominent role and um, power and voice for workers and um, experts who, you know, really, and the, the general public, um, so that actually good decisions can be made and, you know, people can be um, empowered and uh, hopefully you avoid corruption and some of the other pitfalls that can come with the government. I, I know the EPA uh, supports burning carcinogenic chemicals without any train wreck and calling it biofuel production. Mm -hmm. um, how, how exactly how bad is this disaster in Ohio compared with other things to, as far as we know thus far? What are we dealing with? Yeah, I mean, we've had a lot of um, pretty terrible environmental disasters, so uh, I couldn't necessarily off the top of my head just rank it, but I think it's a great example of how um, dangerous, uh, you know, in how dangerous the railroad industry can be because we had, um, you know, for especially back during the fracking boom, um, we had these mile plus long trains, some people would call them bomb trains carrying crude oil, you know, going through Chicago and other metropolitan areas, you know, we have toxic chemicals um, being transported all the time, um, not to mention just the, you know, the, uh, what happens when a train hits a, a truck or a person uh, at a crossing. Um, so, you know, there's just the potential for massive environmental and public health tragedies. Um, even with the best run rail system, there's going to be that risk. But when you have a system where, you know, workers and critics would say that corners are cut and it's um, safety and maintenance and it's understaffed and, um, you know, just inherently when you're investing, when profit is being massive, of profits are being diverted to shareholders and to um, huge salaries for executives, you know, as, as opposed to being plowed back into just making it the absolute safest, most perfectly modernized, most environmentally friendly system it could be, um, you know, you're losing a potential to make it safer when you have this, this massive profit motive. And, the, and they're shipping more and more of these chemicals, right? And in the Trump years, I think they authorized shipping uh, liquefied uh, natural gas by by rail and nobody, Biden hasn't undone anything Trump did, right? So uh, there's potential for this to happen more and more, isn't there? The tracks aren't getting any newer. Right, probably. I mean, the you know, the companies do trumpet how much they invest in their track maintenance. I mean, they do invest in it, but... Um, uh, there's got to be ways to do it better. And the workers for many years have been uh, fighting against a push for one man trains, like basically for having one person running a train that's more than a mile long and carrying this hazardous stuff. Right now, it's generally two people on a train, which also seems like too little, um, but one seems especially scary. So, you know, that's just one example of how if the companies get their way, there could be more potential for these risks. Um, but, you know, on that note of carrying toxic chemicals, I mean, ideally we would be using a lot less chemicals and we wouldn't be using natural gas, you know, uh, so ideally we just wouldn't be shipping as much of this stuff, but to the extent that we are like rail is a lot safer than trucks. So, you know, that's actually another argument for expanding um, maybe for nationalization and, you know, for making a safer, more efficient rail system. So if we're going to ship this toxic stuff, it's actually better to have it shipped by rail than by truck. Um, so, yeah. And probably a lot of things environmentally, it could be more efficient uh, and safer to ship by rail than, than by truck if it were done right, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And that's another argument for nationalization, actually, is that, um, I mean, rail is, uh, other than barge in a way, could be more efficient, but that doesn't um, work for every, you know, commodity or route. Uh, so rail is known as really the most efficient, even as it currently stands, the most efficient emissions-wise form of freight transportation. And then you could, uh, most en uh, environmental, I should say. Um, and you could make it much more so if you put those profits back into electrifying the rail yards, um, you know, cutting out diesel equipment wherever possible, making the absolute cleanest diesel where you are using diesel. Um, there's a whole lot that could be even electrifying some 
uh, routes and and passenger service, passenger rail service. So, you know, you could really reduce the public health and um, greenhouse gas climate change impacts of transportation if you did invest a lot of this massive profit back into actually making rail the cleanest it could be. There's a, an activist group called the Backbone Campaign that for years has promoted this proposal they wrote up to not just nationalize and electrify, but use the, the routes of the trains for electrical wires to distribute uh, sustainably, renewably produced uh, electricity around the country. Um, oh, wow. It seems like uh, there are there are opportunities to think of things if you if you own the stuff, right? Right, right. That's a fascinating idea. I didn't know about that, but it totally makes sense. That's something you could do if you had ownership in the public good. I'll find that report and send it to you. Um, Great. Backbonecampaign.org. Um, the, the, this is this is an issue around the world, right? Other countries have trains, and other countries have governments. How? How is how is this handled uh, elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, it is interesting. The U.S. is, I think, the most expansive freight rail system, or it might be number two, I'm forgetting now. But, you know, we do have a much bigger freight rail system than most other countries. Um, but yeah, lots of other countries have railroads, both freight and passenger. And nationalization is a pretty common model worldwide. Um, I mean, it's, and it is the model in a lot of countries right at this moment, although, you know, in keeping with global capitalism in general, um, over the past uh, two decades or so, there's, you know, been increased pressure to privatize or in, um, introduce uh, private control and investment in nationalized systems. And that's actually um, already played out in some bad ways in the UK and in Germany, where uh, partial attempts at privatization um, resulted in just some chaos. And in the UK, um, a lot of accidents were attributed by uh, by privatization critics, you know, to the privatization that was tried there. Um, so it hasn't gone smoothly in many cases where where that has happened. And uh, there's some great, a lot of great examples of, you know, really modern, clean, um, nationalized railroads running, even in, in countries that the U.S. Uh, considers itself, um, you know, uh, more innovative or more advanced than. So, you know, we're kind of um, backwards compared to some other countries in, in our rail, especially our passenger rail. And, um, you know, that's uh, probably largely because of the 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 power of these private companies that you know don't necessarily have the motivation to um innovate or or be as as uh, clean as possible we're we're speaking with Carrie Leiterson whose article at in these times is called the case for nationalizing the railroads um it, it does say i mean i know that we need trillions and trillions for wars and that's very important to everyone but it does seem that if Congress had control of the railroads, uh, we would be in a slightly better position to say, hey, could you take like 2% of that military money and put it into, you know, building the kind of infrastructure that other countries have rather than this ancient, decrepit, dangerous infrastructure, right? Yeah, and I mean, you, of course, you wouldn't want um, Congress <laughs> to directly control it since Congress often can't do anything at all. But um, but yeah, you know, if you have a really good um, board or, you know, public ownership structure that actually makes the decisions and then you have Congress allocating any form of both nationalizing the railroads, like actually taking that control um, and then starting to run them or starting to own and keep up the infrastructure um, would be massively expensive, uh, massively. But, you know, we do find money. Um, we have a, an incredibly huge defense budget on an annual basis. Um, when we have something like the pandemic or the Ukraine war, uh, we find many billions of dollars to deal with that. Um, even there were actually examples of um, nationalization during Obama and Bush years with the bailouts of auto industries and um, insurance giants. And I mean, those were actually called nationalization um, by some people at the time and, you know, involved massive amounts of government money to rescue those industries. So it is does seem possible to find this money. And then we would 
be creating tons of jobs and tons of investment um, with things like track upgrades and expansions. And uh, so, you know, there'd be ripple economic benefits, huge ones uh, that would theoretically funnel money back to the government, not to mention, or the public, not to mention that you just wouldn't, you know, you'd be having the revenue. So you wouldn't be diverting that revenue to shareholders. You could, um, uh, ultimately be, uh, you know, paying, paying the public back, uh, as it continues to operate. What is this massively profitable system? It seems like if we mention the need for investment and infrastructure and jobs, uh, I will immediately have people screaming at me that their hero, Joe Biden, has already signed into law the biggest infrastructure and investment bills in the history of the universe. And how could we how could we ask for more in such a glorious moment? Um, how, how, how would this compare to what's to what's recently been done? This seems bigger, right? Yeah, I mean, what Biden, you know, I, I write about energy, like the Inflation Reduction Act investments in clean energy. I mean, they're pretty, pretty huge and pretty significant. Um, so, you know, the Biden administration has done some pretty amazing things on infrastructure and energy and related investments. Um, but yeah, like, why stop at that if there's uh, this kind of momentum and, you know, showing what might be possible? Um, I mean, this would maybe be bigger in some ways. It would definitely be bigger and different in the sense that you're curbing the, um, you know, the other, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act actually provides a, a lot of money and tax breaks to private companies, um, which is is part of the reason that you know it's working and was passed. Um, in this case, you'd be uh, you know undercutting um, the profits of massive companies. So that is kind of a fundamentally different and trickier thing. But um, it doesn't seem like it's something that should be impossible. Uh, the Bi candidate Joe Biden actually promised two trillion dollars in clean energy investment, uh, which, correct me if I'm wrong, is bigger than what they actually have done, uh, and free, uh, not sorry, free, uh, emissions free public transit in every city of 100,000 or more, I believe it was. So, so promising bigger things uh, seems to be acceptable. I don't know about doing them, um, but they, but they have talked about bigger things than they've actually done. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, of course all candidates do that, but um, uh, you know, that whole like dreaming big, taking bold actions, not just dreaming, but actually doing big things. I mean, people across the political spectrum say they want that. So, you know, this could be an example of actually doing that. And it should really, I mean, I know a lot of people would be um, outraged and terrified sort of by the concept of um, government or the public taking ownership of, you know, something that's owned by private companies, but um, it would actually benefit pretty much everyone except for those shareholders and executives of the companies. And even then, I don't think anyone's realistically talking about just seizing their prop their property. I mean, you really couldn't do that um, under our current structure, you know, so it would all, uh, there's ways that it could be done in, in constitutional and um, fair ways that involve compensation and, you know, really just would end up uh, having so many benefits for so many different stakeholders in the long run and even the short run. And, and this was considered a, a more reasonable idea at points in the past in, in the story of the United States, right? And there even have been brief periods of nationalization, right? Yeah, the railroads actually themselves were nationalized uh, for periods of a, a couple of years um, around both World War One and World War Two under kind of wartime um, emergency measures. And actually, I'm sure I didn't know this until doing research for this story. I'm sure most Americans don't that actually uh, hundreds of individual companies and industries were nationalized um, for relatively brief periods, you know, especially during both of those war times. So it's not at all unprecedented. Um, and it actually went really well. There were great improvements, both for working conditions and infrastructure and effectiveness um, in during that those railroad nationalizations and in other uh, cases with um, it was I was interested to learn even Montgomery Ward was briefly nationalized, you know, factories, steel mills um, have been nationalized in the past uh, by our government. The difference is those were always intended to be temporary. Um, 
and you know with emergency justifications so that would be a little different but you could say that you know we're in an emergency even if it's like a slower burn i mean climate change is an emergency um you know and railroad nationalization could help address that um you know the uh the fact that we almost had a strike that could have paralyzed the economy and cost whatever billion it was per day, you know, you could call that an emergency. So there definitely seems to be justification for invoking that kind of power and um, and sustaining it as opposed to just having it be for a year or two. There is a story in a book by John Nichols called The Genius of Impeachment about Truman seizing steel mills and then uh, nearly getting himself thrown out on his public assets for it. I mean, there <laughs> there was some resistance there. Oh, positively. Yeah. I mean, there would, uh, I mean, I think there was resistance from the companies themselves in all these cases and and from Congress. But um, yeah, there, there's a really uh, interesting part of the story in the, the World War One era nationalization of the railroads, um, where a prominent lawyer named Glenn Plum had put forward this plan called the Plum Plan that really did get traction and was introduced in Congress and had a lot of backers, um, including labor leaders and um, I think corporate leaders too, that would have called for continuing the railroad nationalization and having, a, having it governed by a board of stakeholders including workers and representatives of the public and um and this was actually a, a popular plan and uh you know of course it faced opposition and and didn't pass but um it's not you know just uh an outlandish nationalization as a concept and nationalization of the railroads you know isn't uh this wild-eyed thing it's something that you know like any big change um will face a lot of pushback but you know also has a lot of um can have a lot of backers you know level-headed people on all different sides of the issue so um carrie Leiderson, with just a few minutes left we in this worst of both worlds situation now it seems when obama was president there was some discussion of imposing a lot of reforms uh that was largely backed off on because of corporate influence on government um and then uh things only made worse i think during the trump years and not much improved during the biden years is that is that accurate um, I mean, I, I think you're talking about, you know, sectors in general, not just railroads. And um, well, maybe so. Yeah. I was thinking about railroads, but yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, that's probably accurate to say. And I think I mean, this past year um, has there has been there are big promises by the administration and by Pete Buttigieg to, you know, demands made on the railroads um, back during those hearings in April um, before the Surface Transportation Board that does have some regulatory authority over railroads. Um, uh, you know, after those, uh, the administration made demands of the railroads and um, ordered them to do sort of improvement plans to say how they would do better. And then, of course, um, the strike negotiations, you know, turned out pretty well for the companies, but um, they did have to uh, make some compromises in that labor deal that was ultimately signed. And then with this derailment in Ohio, um, more scrutiny and, you know, the EPA is threatening to uh, impose their super fund powers and force, I mean, this should just be an obvious given, you would think, but force Norfolk Southern to do a, a cleanup and if they don't, you know, to pay triple for the cost of it to, to the government. Um, so, I mean, there is definitely uh, increased, I think, just in the past year, um, the administration has made a lot of increased demands on railroads. Um, so, you know, I mean, back to what you said then about promises in the past, not necessarily um, bearing fruit, you know, I guess the coming months and years will show um, whether there's any meaningful change, you know, resulting from this uh, this past year of, of tumult in the railroad world. Uh, very well said. I should mention that people can email their Congress members and the White House about this issue at a place I work called rootsaction.org. We've been speaking with Carrie Leiderson. Uh, the article is The Case for Nationalizing the Railroads at In These Times. We'll have a link up at talkworldradio.org. Carrie, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you so much. 
This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.